Hi, I'm David Lovegrove. Welcome to the Portal Superpowers. In this week's video, I share a series of experiences that happened to me between 1980 and 1983. In April this year, I was invited to be interviewed by the Shared Crossing Project. And I spoke to Dr. Michael Kinsella, who's the Chief of Research for the project. And this interview goes onto their database and I was very graciously allowed to share it with you. So I won't say any more. I'll let you get in and hear my story, my personal testimony. I, I just want to assure you that what I say here is absolutely true. Uh, none of this is made up and you'll no doubt come to the same opinion as, as I did and he did that there's much more to life than you think. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so uh, today is April 21st, uh, April 22nd in Australia, uh, 2022. Yep. And um, David, could I please get your full name? David Stewart Lovegrove. And how did you learn about us, the Shared Crossing Project? I was invited by Lisa Smart to join um, a webinar with William. And Dr. Moody and Lisa was there too. So I sort of found out then. And David, where do you presently live? A little town called Mawillambar in uh, northern New South Wales in Australia. And how would you describe your work or occupation or what you do? Um, I'm a writer, a speaker and an artist. Um, I, I illustrate, do comics and... Um, illustrations for books also I do fine art paintings and that sort of stuff and so with what ethnicity or, or ethnicities do you identify um well I I'm an Australian obviously but I'm uh British Scottish I'm I'm pretty much pure Scottish ancestry wise so I guess that's a Caucasian <laughs> <laughs> and uh David, uh, what we do now is we just ask people to briefly summarize their religious or spiritual history. So could mm -hmm. uh, I just get you to briefly uh, just talk a little bit about your religious or spiritual upbringing, if you have one? Yep. Well, I was um, brought up in a family that wasn't really religious. They identified as a Presbyterian, which is a Scottish church, uh, Protestant. Uh, I was sent to Sunday school a bit as a little fella, but my parents didn't go to church. Maybe at Christmas we might have gone. And then at 12, I had a bit of a spiritual experience where I, I was being pestered by some friends to get saved and ask Jesus into my life. So I sat under a table and I said to God, I'm not moving until you appear to me. This is a typical 12-year-old. And after a number of hours... God sort of appeared like I didn't see him but I I felt very very strong that God was real it's sort of a golden presence so I I started going to church myself I actually converted my mother and we were um mum and I used to go to church every Sunday and I was pretty serious about it right through high school and then after high school I became a bit wild became a surfer really didn't go to church just partied on the weekends and um, then after I had my near-death experience I became part of a Christian community of sort of hippie surfies who'd become Christians so like Jesus people in um, 1980 and then I became a lay pastor I used to help run the church I used to preach and um, then a couple of years in, I started to have trouble with 
dogmas and things that people believed. I, I read the Bible right through. I studied. That's all I ever thought about. And then I, I came to a point where I just, I felt there was more and then I sort of moved away. So since then, I, I, have, I don't identify as a Christian in the classical sense. I'm very much into studying other world religions. If I was going to pin myself down now, I'd say I'm a Taoist, you know, the sort of Chinese Taoist. Okay. And yeah. it sounds like uh, you've had a, a number of, um, well, let's say you've been, you've been engaged in, in uh, some kind of mindfulness practice or contemplative practice for a while, yes? Or yes. Um, funny enough, as a child, when I had that, as a 12-year-old, when I, I sort of challenged God to appear, I had been watching this show about Japanese ninjas and samurais, just called the samurai, very popular amongst Australian kids. And somehow I learned to meditate from watching that show. And I remember doing that sort of stilling my mind, stilling my breath. So essentially I meditated. And um, ever since then, I've been on some kind of path um, to find God, find the reality of these things. And um, so thank you. Uh, what we'd like to do now is, is I'd really like to just um, open up some space for you to share the experience that, you, experience that you had previously written to us about that occurred in 1981. Um, yep. So uh, if you could just jump into that, but also kind of help us by uh, setting the stage, you know, just provide some context about how you, how you came to be there on that day. Yeah, well, um... It was interesting because I'd been a nurse. I, I started nursing training in 1977. Um, my sister and I were the first brother and sister to start nursing together. We were even in the paper. And I trained as a, a general nurse. I was training to be a registered nurse uh, for two years. And then for different reasons, I, I transferred to a lower, it was just called enrolled nurse, which was still, you know, trained nurse, but I kept that going and then probably about 1979 I I stopped nursing and became a gardener and I then worked on the land I I ended up um after my near death experience in early 1980 I I got a job on a an apple orchard and I was a farmer and that was just a wonderful time but so Fast forward to, it was probably late 1981. Um, I was building a rock wall at this hospital and it was really hard, filthy work. And my mate worked for an employment agency and he said to me, that hospital's got a job for a, a nurse. Would you like to try? And I initially went, oh, I don't think I want to go back to that. You know, it's nursing, It's it can be difficult. and He's like, but you get twice what you're getting now, you know, twice an hour. And I went, oh, all right. So I said yes. And he, it was a funny arrangement because he, he arranged it so that I, I'd work as a labourer for three days a week and a nurse for two days a week. So I went from being completely filthy out in the sun, real hard yakka, you know, moving rocks by hand, digging holes into this pristine white nurse's uniform all squeaky clean so the very first day I went from filthy tough young labourer to squeaky clean white <laughs> nurse I walked in there and I'm going oh what am I doing I smelt it you know the smell of a ward the smell of all sorts of things and I thought uh oh this might be a mistake and then the nursing sister, that's what we call it in Australia, the registered nurse said to me, uh, first job, you can go and sit with this lady. She's, uh, she's at the end of her life. Uh, she's not for resuscitation. Um, you know, the doctors have said not to start trying to resuscitate her, but we just want you to stay with her until she's actually heart stops. Then you let us know. So I was put in this room and there was this lady, probably 70, very um, big in body and very unconscious. And 
very um it was a very hot day and so it wasn't a pleasant atmosphere and i started feeling quite nauseous actually and thinking uh, why have i done this why have i come back to this nightmare i, I want to be out there in the in the paddocks again working so anyway i thought no i gotta do this so i i sat there and i was just taking a pulse every couple of minutes and um i don't know if you know this but it's quite surprising how slowly the heart can beat and a lot of people when they're dying might be beating like twice a minute and so it's like you're just constantly feeling for that next beat and as i was doing this you know i'm touching the lady and I just started feeling really sorry for her thinking isn't life disgusting you know like so many indignities this was once a young person and now she's very obese and here she is dying it stinks you know it's really smelly um poor thing you know I just I just felt really sorry for her and then it was like oh where's the beat the next beat didn't come i waited and then i i rang the buzzer and the sister came and she said i'll um i'll get the doctor you stay so as i as i stood there looking at her i was feeling these same things like isn't this terribly sad and i, I was feeling not revulsion at her just at life that it does this to people that we end up you know so broken down and you know so and then it was like something golden and shimmery went through my head it was like tinkerbell it was like literally like you know a disney movie of a fairy it was i sort of could see in my mind's eye this um golden sparkles and this golden glow and a very young woman's voice sound you know like a young teenager said to me don't feel sorry for me i'm young again and as i heard that i was just instantly filled with this incredible bliss it was like i was just once again speechless with bliss and i probably had tears in my eyes but i i know that it was like wow you know she's not this old pile of body you know she's young again you know and i could just sort of see her i, I could sort of see the old lady's face and i could see that young lady's face and i sort of felt she went that way it was like like she came up and went through my head and spoke to me and then kept going and I knew nothing of near-death experiences. I didn't even know I'd had one. You know, I what I what happened to me at the time, I I didn't know it was called a near-death experience, but I really um it just it was like there is life after death, you know. I'd sort of believed it, but this was like there really is that. And then Years later, I looking back, I realized that, um, you know, people come out, they report coming out of their bodies and then I'll read people's minds and see what people are feeling. And, and I, I thought, yeah, that's what would have happened. She came out. Where am I? Oh, look at this guy. Oh, he feels so sad for me. Hey, it's all right. I'm young again. That's what happened. So that was a marvelous thing. Thank you. Um, Thank so, you. yeah. So just a few questions here. How, in terms of time, how much time do you think transpired between realizing that that next pulse wasn't coming and then having that, 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 that shimmering and then hearing her voice and then that feeling that she took off? How, in terms of time, how much time do you think transpired there? That's a good question. I think Once I, once the pulse hadn't come after a minute and a bit, I thought, well, that's it. It's not going to come. Then I would have rung the buzzer. And the sister came pretty quick, I remember. 
and then it happened just after that. So I reckon no more than maybe a minute or two minutes. Okay. But yes, there is that possibility that she was there for a little bit and, you know, seeing what had happened, seeing herself there, and then somehow, you know, how people can read what's going on. And then really she didn't, she didn't say anything else to me. It, it didn't feel like she hung around. She just sort of stopped and said, you know, to this caring guy, she would have read exactly who I was, probably realized that I was somebody that could hear her, you know, like because of my NDE. Maybe, I don't know whether I could have heard her if I hadn't had my own experiences, but I knew it was real. I, I sort of lived in a spiritual space and I didn't just think, oh, that was just a fantasy. I, I knew it was actually real. It was the it was a strong feeling of bliss and that that sort of sense of the golden light and golden tinkling something so that convinced me. This is something I'd like to ask you because we, we have a number of, of similar reports of people reporting of reporting this this shimmering, this twinkling, this 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 golden hue, this light, uh, and the phrase Tinkerbell's even been used before to try to articulate or describe that. And so I, I'd like to ask you is how did how did you how did you perceive that? Uh, was it like in the mind's eye? Was it like uh, was it out there in the world? Uh, again, I know we're relying on conventions and language. We're kind of hitting up against a brick wall. But if you could just try to walk me through a description of, of, of how you sensed or saw that. Well, you know, it was exactly what I experienced sitting under the table when I said to God, you appear to me. I want to know that you're real. I want to, I'm not going to commit myself to Jesus if you're not real. And it was the same thing. It's it's almost between worlds. It's like a it's a vision, but it's a feeling. You know, it's like it's like you enter you, you slightly enter a different dimension, and you can sort of see it. Like it's almost like peripheral vision. You know, when you you sort of just look to the sides rather than focus on something. It's like that, but it's like my mind could perceive. And my imagination as an artist has developed this thing, you know, to quite a high level. But I, I really always had this sort of a gift where I was called a dreamer and people would say, Dave, Dave, you know, come back. So going off with the fairies, literally, um, it's always been a characteristic with me. And I, I think it's a, it's a gift and it has its place in society, you know. But definitely, I, I felt like it was virtual, but real. So it was like it was overlaid, you know, you ever put on those 3D goggles and you can sort of see the, the room you're in, but, you know, you, you're drawing stuff and it's hanging there in space. It's like that. It's like you can see the real world that sort of overlays it. And yeah. It's like that's a, great, that, that's a great way to describe it. I mean, I, 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 I followed you completely on that. Yeah, yeah. So you said something, and I was going to wait to talk about this, but I, I'd like to pursue it now if it's okay with you. Um, that you, you, you questioned whether or not that you were afforded this experience because you had previously had a near death experience of your own. Yes. Do you do you think? Well, I, first of all, let's just. Uh, I'd like for you to talk a little more about that. I mean, do you do you think that is the case, or, or no? Um. Yes, I think it is the case. I think when you have a near death experience, it's like any profound spiritual experience. I guess it sort of strengthens the ties to that wonderful dimension that's outside this life it's like as if i in my i don't know is it okay to say the book <laughs> the, sure. the portal, yeah. portal i'm writing my my essential thesis is that there is a a virtual portal sort of round above in the back of the head it's like a a gateway into the divine dimension 
And in the book, I sort of talk about how there's all sorts of ways to access it outside of religion or specific meditation. It's, you know, there's other art forms and things where this happens to people. But I think in a near-death experience, it's just opened up because of the dramatic circumstance. The, in my case, I, I had an undiagnosed, well, I got extremely ill for three days with what I think was either meningitis or encephalitis. So I was by myself in a combi van, no one around, no drink, no food, no help. And, and I, it was a very traumatic experience, but I, you know, that sort of opened up something. And this happened, this event with the lady in the hospital happened in the first year and a half um, and I seem to have that connection on most of the time and I would affect some people sometimes I'd just be smiling at somebody and they'd say oh I can feel God coming out of you you know oh, there's something coming out of you and it, it was just it was like I just had this cable <laughs> it was you know sometimes it would just go and other times it would close up and yeah, so so that I mean. space that that space that you're describing you know um the imaginal realm or, or or what have you that that kind of in between worlds that you're describing was that kind of a similar or the same space that you found yourself in during your near death experience um no, during my near-death experience, I went to a completely different place. I, I went to a heaven-type place, but um, for me, it was there was nobody there. It was like um, the Elysian Fields. It was just an endless sea of grass and low hills, and I don't think there was flowers, but I just remember a blue sky, but I it was definitely, I went from one realm to the other. And in my, my NDE, I actually had one of those, those negative experiences where I, I sort of went to almost like to a hellish realm where I was confronted by something like a, in the Lord of the Rings, you know, that um, Narwog or something that Gandalf says, you shall not pass, you know, it was Balrog, like- Balrog, yeah. Yeah, Balrog. I pretty much had a Balrog experience. And, um, I defeated the Balrog with the help of Jesus at the time. A guy cried, I screamed out to God to help, but then I went to that place. So for me, it wasn't really, I, I didn't have the coming out, looking at my body thing that I can recollect. I've never remembered any coming out of the body. I've never recollected any tunnel of light. And I always felt a bit bad about that. And that's why I found it when I, told you about these other experiences that I had um, where I shared my near-death experience with other people later it seemed like the tunnel of light came then you know so I didn't really miss out I just didn't I didn't have it at the time <laughs> and in this this shared death experience that you're talking about now that occurred correct me if I'm wrong about a year and a half after your near-death experience yes that's right okay okay and have you, let me ask this first, have, did you have any other experience, contact, uh, visit, what have you with that woman? No, I, that was literally the first day in the first hour that I came back to nursing after at least two years away from it. So it was really a shocking change. And yeah, I don't, to this day, I don't know who she was, but I, I think she was an islander lady. Um, we have a lot of people who, whose ancestors came from the Torres Strait Islands and the Solomon Islands to, to work here, sort of, um, yeah, in the cane and that sort of thing. So I think she was one of those ladies and, and maybe she didn't have family around. I usually in that sort of, place where somebody's passing away usually the family comes in but I have to assume there wasn't anybody for her which has probably also made me sad I probably realized that at the time that there should be people there yeah 
have you had any other have you had any other shared death experiences or any experiences around the time of a death of someone? Um, yes. This one's not as dramatic, but it's pretty far out. I, when I was a, a nurse in this big hospital, the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane, um, it was it was the second year there, so it would have been. 1978, I seem to remember that I was the senior nurse where we basically ran the ward, um, giving out injections and running the drips and doing observations and the pills, etc. So I remember taking this young trainee nurse who was on a very first day to give an old man a sponge bath. And we walked in and I'd been told the man they said he's not they told me we used to do a thing called a report where they tell you about all the patients when you start the shift and they said you yeah, know this this man's not for resuscitation because of his age and whatever the doctors assess him so they don't go trying to resuscitate him uh, but just he's just come in last night and just go and give him a sponge bath he's not supposed to leave the bed so i went in with a bowl of water and the towels and the young nurse and said you know good morning mister I looked at his name tag um on nurse lovegrove I'm just going to give you a quick sponge bath and he was sitting up in the bed and i i think he might have just had breakfast and he seemed you know a sweet old fella and he looked sort of normal you know he didn't look sick would have been in his late 80s and um he looked at me looked at me with the biggest grin and he said, I'm going home now. And then he looked past me and his grin got even bigger. And then that was it. And he just stopped in this fixed sort of, I guess his face relaxed a bit, but he, he just, he was looking past me with love and wonder. And, and I'm like checking the pulses, checking on his neck. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, he's really has gone home. And the young nurse started crying and she's going, what's wrong with him? And I said, oh, he's, he's just died. And she'd been actually a bit of a pain. I, everything I'd told her during that day, she kept saying, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that. I knew she didn't know it and I also knew she was just nervous, but yeah, I know, yeah, I know. All right. And then after this, she ran off crying. It was too much for her. And later that day, she came up to me and said, David, I know nothing and please tell me, you know, please teach me. She became really humble and it was a beautiful thing because that man's death sort of touched her. But it was just, I mean, it was extraordinary for me, but for her, it was the first time she'd seen somebody dead, that he died right in front of her. And then to say that I'm going home now, it was so absolute, you know, there was no, no, uh, no two uh, ways about it. I want to uh, go back to um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, that's a lovely story. That's 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 something. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a, a question uh, about the uh, the shared death experience you had. Um, you know, of course, that's what we focus on. Um, what do you think caused that experience in terms of like agency? Do you think that you had some ability, have some ability to? see beyond the veil see what happens or do you think she instigated that experience and was reaching out and wanted to communicate to you um and, you know or, or or do you have some other idea i guess i'm trying to discern who do you think instigated that experience if that's a fair question i think it was both of us i think it was my sympathetic feeling for her my genuine mourning and and feeling of sadness for her that she should come to an end of a long life no friends no family just me this guy didn't really want to be there sort of feeling like fish out of water being a nurse again and I'd spent the last year and a half with this Christian community literally Louis like monks we were celibate 
we'd get up at five in the morning, we'd pray, we'd sing praise songs, you know, of guitars. Uh, I'd spend my whole day working, but praying all day, talking to God all day, uh, reading the Bible, didn't watch TV, didn't read newspapers. I was just, I was going to be a missionary, you know, I was just, I was going to be a minister and I was absolutely devoted. So I, I was in an unusual place in that I lived in that sort of world of faith and listening for the voice of God, you know, the subtle, what we believe that God would talk to you. So, yeah. And my couple with my near death experience, which made me somebody a bit unusual, I think it was a symbiosis, but I, you know, I think she, her spirit, she felt my heart that I cared she saw that I was sad because of her death. She said, oh, no, don't be sad. I'm away. Woohoo, let's go, you know. It's all cool. Don't worry about it. So, so do you think then that that experience was possibly orchestrated uh, for your benefit or was it some lesson that it imparted to you? It was just part of the great, incredible adventure of life, you know. The, like, it's a without getting too deep into it i i see this this life as like alan watts said you know it's just the most it's a dream it's the most incredible dream it's just so real so joyful painful shocking blissful all the things but yeah everything works together for good you know there's so many of the bible verses and spiritual things they're so spot on and it's like it obviously had a meaning here i am telling you about it 40 years later it's still something special and um that lady's perhaps been reborn again you know i do believe reincarnation is real and so quite possibly i might have met her because it was in this town where i lived I've been away for a long time, came back, you know, I've been here for about 20 years, but really, um, yeah, she was probably pretty stoked to have a dude like me there, you know. Yeah. It was like, I, I was an unusual dude. <laughs> I was this young surfy, but I was like this, you know, sort of character from the Bible, I suppose. So how has both this, this shared death experience and your near-death experience can you talk a bit about how that's impacted your views on what happens to us after we die? Um, yeah, the always the thing <clears throat> for me after the near-death experience, I mean, I was so seriously ill and it could have all been just some kind of febrile hallucination, you know, it could have, could have so easily just been my dying mind coming up with this outrageous fantasy like dreams can be really just far out it was these other experiences afterwards these shared death experiences and spiritual experiences that convinced me wow that was real you know like it wasn't just uh you know uh a febrile hallucination it was actually it was real because of the power that came out of me and and it was it was also the fact that it affected other people like you can be a little bit mentally ill or something and you think that people are talking to you and all sorts of things going on where it's real or not but when when other people are affected then you know wow this is actually real this is not just me i'm not just a tripper you know because you know I, I i grew up pretty straight but in my surfy years used to uh smoke the uh, green cigarettes every now and then and i was just in that scene in the 70s very uh countercultural hippie um this was sort of like woodstock area here so you know you you were wary of trippiness because you knew that people just trip about all sorts of stuff so you know how easy it is for somebody to really see far out things and believe things. But I, I never really took acid or anything like that. 
but I, I know that I, um, these were not trips. These were not drug trips, you know, nothing like that. Nothing like a flashback. It was so clean and pure and just so much more powerful than normal life. You sort of felt this is the real life, you know, this is, this is the real thing. This is like a real dim version of that. That, that leads me to, to ask you, um, because I know you, we were talking uh, before you had mentioned that you're, you've been exploring world religions and you've read the Bible and you've really immersed yourself in different traditions and in world yeah. views and religions. To what extent are your experiences, to what extent have your experiences influenced or shaped your, your spiritual or your own religious beliefs? Um, well, initially with Christianity, because as I said, I, I interpreted the experience through the lens of Christianity because that's what my faith was and I was very into it. Um, I started having problems with the way Christianity was being presented and enacted in the church I was in and other churches because I sort of knew that God was love, but it wasn't just a concept for me. It was an absolute knowledge. It was like, that's my near death experience was about love. Like I didn't meet anybody, but I felt just absolutely loved and in the bosom of God sort of thing, you know? So love to me was everything. And, you know, I found verses all through uh, the new Testament sayings of Jesus and saying writings of Paul about love and some amazing stuff, you know, saying you can move mountains and do miracles and walk on water virtually. If you haven't got love, you're nothing. You know, you're nothing. <laughs> and that was, that was my mantra. And people started going about hell, gonna stop people from going to hell, gotta make sure they understand they're gonna burn in hell forever. And it, and just instantly I knew, nah, that's wrong. Like that's that's bullshit. <laughs> that's not right. That's not the God I met. That's something else. I don't know what that's what is, but I don't believe it. So I kept it myself, but I thought, no. Nah. And then gradually with time, um, it was very hard to walk away from Christianity because it gave me such an absolute basis for the rest of my life. I was just going to be this minister. I was going to be Billy Graham or something, you know. And then it was like, God, what are you doing? You know, you're slapping this out of my hand. You just gave me this whole thing. I know this book back to front. I know the doctrines, I know all about it. And he's like, no, nah. I just felt God saying, yeah, well, that's baby stuff. Now you're going on, man. You're going to, you're going to learn for yourself now. And, and so sort of God actually shut up for quite a long time and just went, work it out, brother. You know, I'm not going to hold your hand anymore. You're, you're a man now. You got to, you got to really go through it now and, and work it out. And so, you know, I just, through different experiences in life, I met people and, it's funny, actually, that I said I was an orchardist in that first couple of months after my near death experience. I was working on this wonderful orchard. I was all by myself, way out in the bush, you know, like it was just something. And I never saw people. And sometimes I wouldn't see people for two or three weeks. Like I was just by myself for two or three weeks and just birds tweeting, picking apples, eating apples, you know working hard, sleeping at night, reading the Bible, listening to Bob Dylan, uh, Slow Train Coming. That album used to make me just cry. I just, it was so man meaningful to me. Anyway, one day I see this older guy coming up my track and he's about my age now. You know, he's got a beard, pretty much looks like me now, I suppose. He's selling this uh, organic fertilizer based on seaweed. And as he comes up to me, he says, oh, you're a man of God. I said, that's a funny thing to say. How do you know that? He goes, oh, it's hard for me to tell you, but I, I know. He said, you're somebody who's very connected to God. I said, yeah, that's actually true. Um, so we, we had a chat. I made him a cup of tea and he said, look, you're very, very Christian, you know, and I told him my story and he said, I know that you believe that you'll always be a Christian, but I'm, you know, 60, I've been all over the world, I've been in India, done all sorts of stuff. And he said, I, I, I would say 
it might you might be surprised that in many years to come you won't be the same as you are now and you might be more open to all sorts of other spiritual things and i'm like no 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 they're all lies of the devil <laughs> you know the bible's the way man this is you know this is the way it is he's going yeah i understand i can understand it and you know you're a fine fella and, and there's nothing wrong with having a strong belief but you know i think maybe when you become an older man you'll um you'll have a broader understanding and here i am and yes he was right he's probably passed away now but i still remember him you know he's like like a wizard or something turned up you know or a, a swami it was a, it was a nice thing so david how is these how have your experiences then if they have what kind of impact have they had upon your your personal relationship or views about death and dying your relationship to death and dying or or your views about death and dying um like almost all people who've had ndes and lots of experiences i don't really want to go out screaming my head off with a gut wound from a shotgun or been eaten by a shark when I'm surfing or been torn apart by wild dogs. <laughs> you know, I'm a chicken like everybody else. I, I really don't want to have too much pain. But the actual, where I'm going, like, I'd be extremely surprised if I'm not going anywhere. Like, I won't know anyway. I'll just blink out if the atheist is right. But... I don't have any doubt to tell the truth. It's um, it's right there, you know. It's like it's just there. It's the thinnest veil. It's I probably live in there a lot anyway, you know. But it's it's just it's helped me a lot in my life. I think you know to be calm in situations where I might normally be scared that i can just link in i just sort of meditation really to me is stilling the conscious mind which is the one that fears everything and just going back into the rear brain which is what we do in our internal kung fu wing chun and what we do in art you know to create real imaginative masterpieces we don't use this oh, i'll draw this and i'll draw that we just go into a, a space and it just comes out and same with other meditations, you're still, you're still the, the thing that's going, what's happening tomorrow, what happened yesterday? And you go back into the mind that lives in the now, which is the mind that's connected to God. And it seems pretty obvious to me, but it only took me 40 years to work it out. But you know, I, that's, that's why I'm writing a book, because... I've just got something to say. I'm not the great guru, but I'm going, well, dudes, I've had some unusual experiences and I've worked some things out for what it's worth. Here it is. Hope you can get something out of this. And and you touch upon an interesting point. And as you know, a lot of people that have had near-death experiences report being transformed from them or, or being more intuitive or more uh, psychically gifted or sensitive. Um and I'd like to ask you if you feel whether the experience, the NDE or the SDE you had, if those had that result. But I also I'm keeping in mind that you had that really powerful experience when you were 12. And so I'm wondering, you know, did you have that ability or, or these spiritual inclinations well before the NDE? And then you have this very transformative, powerful NDE. So how did, did that and how did that serve as a catalyst if it did for, you know, for these gifts or these psychical sensitivities? Yeah, well, I, I interviewed Colonel um, John B. Alexander, who was the guy that George Clooney's character was based on in the men who stare at goats. Yep. And we've become friendly and you know, he's a lovely guy and he just gave me hours and hours of his time. And we talked quite a bit about this stuff, about how you develop powers, you know, because he was in the remote viewing program and all this CIA army stuff. And he said what I've also read in yogic um 
cities, you know, the unusual powers. Um, some people are born and perhaps they got it from past lives, you know, perhaps they've brought it forward. But even if you leave aside reincarnation, some people are just sort of born with a bit of a natural gift. And I, I think I was. <laughs> Funny enough, my mum, who's 87, is a very, very straight Christian. She told me that my Scottish great-grandmother told her when she was young that she had a different way of seeing. And she told my mother that she was a seer, what the Scots call, I can't even say it, there's a tabe siak or something like that. It's a, it's a sort of a seer. So that was my great grandmother. And I know my grandmother used to read tea leaves and I picked up that she'd always joke about it, but I think she really believed it was, she could sort of see stuff. So I think I come from a bit of a family and I've heard from other members of the family that they've had experiences, but I think that the, um, at 12, I'd actually had a lot of very febrile diseases. I had mumps twice. I had really bad glandular fever and I always felt as a kid that it did something to my brain it was like it cooked it you know like and then I, I've read that the medicine men of the American Indian people often started at 12 like 11 or 12 from being really sick so so that yeah there's that and I, I think that the NDE was like get, taking the car down the shop and getting it turbocharged it was like the ND. I, I had this hole like this that I could access, and the ND went <laughs> just like just made the bloody thing huge. So, what I'd like to do now is what we what we often do is ask uh, a few questions with regard to sharing stories. But I really want to present you an opportunity because I, I I would really like to hear this myself. For you to talk about what we, we were talking a bit about beforehand about you sharing your experience with people that really had no interest in it these these tough and rumble guys yeah would you mind sharing yeah. that yeah i'd love to well it started off with um a mate of mine who was i, I joined a scottish pipe band I'm, I'm a snare drummer and i was okay you know i wasn't great but I, I was good enough to play in a band and reasonable band and this young fellow was um a champion from scotland he was like insanely good like i don't know if you've ever seen scottish snare drummers really going off but it's something else and this guy was like that but he was the most laid back he always had a ciggy hanging out his mouth he was a real dry witted glasgow guy you know he used to call me a bomb pot which means an idiot and um you know a bit of a bit of a kook and he was just like we we're sitting having a couple of beers at this pub uh, on the gold coast and he's like oh you know dave you're a bomb pot he says this all this god stuff it's all horseshit you know surely you can see that there's nothing to it i'm going yeah i know mate i know the religious aspects the churchy stuff it's sort of yuck but I, he said, he says, why do you believe? And I said, well, you know, I had this trippy experience that convinced me that it's real. He says, I, nothing can convince me. If he was, this is in this broad Glasgow accent. So he's sitting there with his ciggy and he's, he says, tell me. So I start telling him. And I said, you know, I was in the combi van. I got really sick. This happened, this happened, this happened. And as I'm saying it, I just felt this like, come out of me like that golden thing but it's like it feels like honey and it's really blissful and holy but you know, it's a funny word holy but it's it's holy it's just sort of white and just way above this this life and he's looking at me going what is that and then tears rolled up in his eyes he goes what what's going on I said, can you feel that? He goes, bloody hell. <laughs> he says, it's real. I never expected that. He says, that's, I can feel that. You know, and I'm just telling him a story, but he felt that. And um, for a couple of weeks, he became intensely into it. He wanted to be a Christian. And 
but you know Christianity's a hard pill to swallow the the whole the straight and the solid no more sex you know no more drugs no more rock and roll uh go to church the old timers you know playing the organ singing the 18th century hymns it was like get his head in and eventually he actually became really nut don't want to know about you dave we sort of fell out a bit hmm. and i still really liked him and his family but i just i realized well unfortunately i lost a few friends at that time because people just went oh stick that christianity but I know to this day he will remember that. He'll be going, what the hell is going on? You know, did Dave hypnotize me? What, what happened? But I didn't intend anything. I was just telling the story. What do you think? How, what, what, can you attempt to offer me um, an explanation or, or just your thoughts as to what do you think happened at that, at that, during that incident? Well, I, I think I, because it was only like, you know, six months or so after the NDE, I still felt raw and I can't exactly explain it, but my brain was really affected. And I still felt that I was maybe a human, maybe I was an angel. I didn't know what I was. I was sort of somehow in between the worlds. And by telling the story, it would just go, it was like the, the pin code or something. It was like, dit, 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 dit. next thing I was attached. And so what came out, I called it the presence of God back then, you know, that's the only way I knew to describe it. It's what Christians call the presence of God. Because people do, religious people do feel this stuff. They interpret it through the lens of their book or their savior or their, their guru or their avatar, but they really, it is, it's a common thing across human experience. and. And the God doesn't necessarily jump in. Oh, no, you're wrong. This is the wrong religion. It's like, doesn't seem to matter. I think it's any way to get there is okay. And then eventually you sort of work out, oh, it's not just that, you know. But, yeah, he, um, he felt what I experienced. It just, it just happened and, and he felt it. And um, do you want me to tell you the other two? They're very mind, well. Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, I I left that little group, the pipe band, and joined this Christian community. So that was a fairly radical thing. I sort of sold everything I had. They weren't like a cult that says, give us all your money. They didn't want anything. But I just got rid of all my sort of worldly possessions, which didn't amount to that much, and went into... Um, a discipleship house where there's, a, you know, several guys living in a house. As I said, we used to get up and five in the morning and pray and sing. And, you know, it's quite unusual. So um, some of the young hippies who joined had come from a place called Bellingen, which was another hippie centre. And we consider ourselves like missionaries to the counterculture, you know, like our we were long-haired freaks and we we're going to go and convert the long-haired freaks to Jesus. So these guys set up um, this, uh, what do they used to call it? Witnessing, right? So we were going to witness to the hippies. And it's a, fair, it's a few hours drive and on the way they're all like, yeah, we're going to really get in there and tell them about how, they, you know, we've got to make sure that the emphasis will be, you got to have the courage to say to them face to face, you're going to burn in hell unless you believe in Jesus. And I'm sitting in the back of the van going, oh, this is wrong. You know, this is not what God's like. This is not what God wants. It's not how to bring people to God. Jesus. <laughs> anyway, we get there and we have a bit of a pray and they're all off and they're going to start god bothering as we call it in australia you know, confronting people hey man you know, there you go just want to tell you about jesus and, and you know and i'm like oh i'm just i'm going to go and witness over here so i go over and hide behind this big tree and i me and god were really close you know i'm going listen this is crap i'm not going to do this you know this i just do not agree with this now you say in the bible What's impossible for man is possible for God. So here's the challenge. You want me to witness to somebody, you make it happen. I'm not going to do a thing. I am not going to do this, right? You make it happen. So 
I'm feeling good, you know, I just cruise off. So I go into this shed and there's all these chickens and uh, you'd probably have it over there, you know, the farmers bring in the best chickens, all different breeds. And there's this massive chicken that looks like what well, an emu, which is this really big bird we have over here. It's massive. And there's this other young fella about my age checking it out and we're both laughing like going, look at this thing, man. It's just like, this is rip you apart. <laughs> these big thighs. And he says to me, um, I haven't seen you around here, brother. Where are you from? I said, oh, I've, I've come down with some friends from up north. I'm, oh, cool. Why have you come down? And I'm like, um, well, we're with this church group called the Trevon Christian Community. He goes, oh, no, man. He, he says, you seem sort of cool. He says, surely you're not into that. I said, yeah, you know, I had long hair, I was a surfer, you know, I, I go, yeah, it's a bit hard to explain. He says, well, you explain it. He says, you seem a cool guy. I, I, why would you be into that rubbish? He said, there's no such thing as God, you know, there's no such thing as heaven. And, okay, so I, I started telling him the story. And at some point in the story, there was a sort of a climax in my NDE and it, it seemed to happen then. He's just listening to me. And then suddenly it was like, I felt like my flesh actually peeled apart, was sort of like vaporized. And this white light, like a million watts, just came out whoom, and just completely surrounded this guy. And I'm just, I'm sort of just completely taken over by it. I'm just standing there, this light's pouring out of me. Now, I, I didn't see any people running out in horror or something. So I don't think anyone saw it. I think it was that spiritual light that you can see, but only those who are. So this guy's looking at me and he goes, what? And he grabs my arms really hard. And he goes, who are you? Who are you? And I'm looking at him, but I can't speak. And he's going, it's real, man. He says, it's real. And then pour, tears are pouring down his face. He's going, it's real. And then he lets me go and he says, I'm really sorry, man. I, I got to go. Like, this is just totally freaking me out. I can't, this is too much. He says, but thank you. Thank you. And then he, he runs to the, the door of the shed and I'm still in this blissed out state. And he turns and goes, thanks, brother. Got to go. And he bolted. He just ran out the door and I'm just standing there going like, you know, like a Bible movie sort of thing, just going, wow. And then unbelievably, a couple of months later, I was heading to church with this mate and my mate was a real lovely character, but he'd been a strong arm man for the mob down in Sydney. He used to go around breaking people's arms if they didn't pay their, their bills. He'd been a heroin addict. He's a bit older than me. He's a real scary guy, but he's a nice guy. And we're just rocking along and there's this guy hitching. So we pulled up and um, <laughs> me and my mate just cut our hair. Like we, we decided these hippies really need a shake up. So we were just like, we got short back and sides and we both went to the op shop and got some ties and we dressed up like real straightos because we knew they'd freak out because they were always saying, oh, the, the straights at the church, they reject us because we got long hair. And we thought, well, we'll show you. You're just the same. So this guy gets in and he immediately goes, oh, man, are you guys D's? You know, detectives. And we look, both look pretty tough. And he's like, we're going, no, nah, no, nah, we're Christians. He goes, oh, that's just as bad. <laughs> and then we're chatting away about surfing. He was a local boy. I, I'd never met him, but, you know, he... Um, we're talking about surfing. He goes, you're a cool dude, you know, Dave. He says, you're, you're one of the boys. I can tell by your talk, but why the hell would you be a Christian? It's just so straight, so boring. And I said, well, I had this experience. And so I'm telling him the experience. And we pulled into this little place called the Mustard Seed, which was our church um, cafe. And... Me and this guy got out. And this guy's really into my story. So we're standing there and exactly the same thing happened. It was like, as I got to that point, 
I just peeled back and the light came out of me super strong. And this guy starts crying and grabs me and goes, who are you? What is this? Who are you? Oh, it's real, man. He, he, he says, I can't believe it's real. And then thank you. And he runs off. And this is a little miracle. He, he runs and it was really hard to hitch on this. It was like this big hill that came down on a sharp turn. So nobody in the right minds would pull over. Just the wrong place to hitch. This guy goes like that. And I'm sort of blissed out watching him run and then stick his thumb out. And this guy just pulls in. He jumps in, takes off. It was just amazing. It was like, whoa, he's gone. And, um, and then I just went in and had a cup of coffee, I suppose. But it was both times I felt like, well, wow, those guys must have really needed that. You know, I, I was used as, I, I wanted to be used. You know, I, I was, God, I got no life. I just want to serve you. I want to tell people about the reality of life after death and heaven and faith and et cetera. So, yeah, so there's three stories. Wow. Um, do you so i've i've studied narrative and it's and, and and the way memory and mind works and how in storytelling one can relive particular moments come very close to approximate approximately reliving those moments and when you were sharing those accounts with those individuals did you get a sense in all or in part that you were essentially reliving some of those moments? Yeah, it was like, like I said to you earlier, I don't think we recorded it, but I, in the late eighties, when I started to read about near death experiences, I felt a bit sort of ripped off that I didn't come out of my body and fly around. That would have been cool. I didn't see a tunnel of light, you know, I always felt like, Oh, why didn't I do that? But those experiences, seem to be the same experience uh, that people have the light that was coming out of me at first i thought did i transform into an angel and i jesus christ had a transfiguration thing up on a mountain which you know i was really scared to make any comparisons with that like i don't want people to think i think i'm jesus christ but i couldn't think of any other way to explain what happened I've always just thought it was just a sort of a holy thing. But since watching, um, you know, William's videos and he talked about shared death experiencing it happened later than at the time, I thought, bloody hell, that's what, I think that's what it is. I think that retelling that experience so close to the time See, I've just told, I haven't told you a thing, but I, if I told you my near-death experience, I don't think I'd suddenly transform and you'd feel the light. I mean, that'd be sort of cool, but I don't think it works like that. I, th I think mm -hmm. it was because it was so close to the time I wasn't quite out of there or something, you know, so it just, it came back and the power. I mean, I'd like to meet those guys, you know. I'm hoping one day somebody's going to see one of these videos and go, Hey Dave, I'm that dude, you know, the hitcher, or I'm the guy. Mm, yeah, you know, yeah, that was insane. My so mate was I don't know what he'd say, but uh, so w w with your with both the SDE and your near death experience, you, you you talked about sharing the near death experience with these three different individuals, but just out of curiosity. How often, how often do you share this or how often do you talk about these experiences with others? Uh, very, very rarely. My wife's heard it a couple of times to the point it means nothing to her. But she, yeah, I mean, she, she knows it's cool stuff, but she's heard my stories a lot. Um, I've always kept it to myself. When I was in the church, I did tell people as a sort of a, what we used to call a testimony, you know, the, the the power and grace of God in your life, I would share it. Uh, even then, people used to go, uh, sounds a little bit too powerful, too trippy. You know, is this real? Is this of God? You know, could it be something else? And I've kept it to myself. But what I'm thankful for is I, you know, this happened in 1980. I'm thankful that in the mid-90s, I wrote all this down in some diaries 
uh, because I just, even then I had the feeling like I better put this down before I get to an age where I think I might just like go and say, oh, is this bullshit? You know, am I just, am I just making this up? But uh, you know, I wrote them down to make sure that I knew they were real too. And you, you, one of the questions we typically ask, and, and you, you have answered this fully, is just the, the value in sharing these experiences. And um, it certainly sounds like um, you are at a stage in your life where you see an inherent value in moving forward and sharing, sharing your personal experiences with others, yes? Yeah, I, I think it's time for people to know this. And I think we still have a lot of religious fanaticism because it's just human psychology. People hold on to their footy team, their, um, you know, whatever they, they patriotic, their whatever to their, their thing. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I think it's a really great time in the study of consciousness. This is like, to me, cutting edge science. And I consider myself a scientist, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty rational person, actually. Uh, it might seem like I'm pretty trippy with these stories, but you know, I was a policeman for a number of years. It's a very serious job. Um, I've you know managed to raise a family, three kids, and make ends meet and do all the things you do. So I, I think the feedback I get from people is that people are really glad people are talking, speaking out, and um, yeah, what you're doing is magnificent. Same as Dr. Moody did with NDEs and um, to, to collect, this is a human treasure. And I, I had an experience when I was at art school in the mid nineties, um, this lovely young fella, uh, he was caught up in the romance of art and all these old stories about artists um, for some reason he decided to try heroin because some of the famous artists had been into it and he OD'd the first time and we were all just so stricken we all liked him a lot and his mum was at we we're at the funeral and his mum was there and I was thinking should I tell her should I tell her and then I just sort of fell and she she was open so I told her my NDE and she kept writing to me after that saying that helped me so much really helped me to know that you know people have these experiences and then I, I feel that I will meet my son again and that he's just not gone because I said to her look don't listen to that atheist crap about it's just the end that's not true it's it's just not true there's plenty of evidence just honest people telling their stories thousands and thousands of people well, I definitely, definitely appreciate you sharing some of your stories with us today. You know, I, I really only have one more question, and um, it, it's really very open-ended question. And it's, we've covered a lot today, but is there anything that, that we haven't covered? Or is there anything that you, you'd like to discuss with regard to your experiences um, before, we, before we end this? Um. I've got one other short story I'd like to tell you. Please. That's, it's cool because it involves a dog. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we're talking about, I'm talking to men. Somebody might say, oh, maybe because I'm so exquisitely handsome, the guys, you know, fell in love with me or something, which wasn't, I don't think it was happening. I was pretty handsome, but, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that. Um, but, you know, humans, you can always say, well, yeah, but humans... Humans can uh, have all sorts of reasons for things, but when I first went to that orchard, um, it could have been the first day, I was told, walk up the paddock, down the road, there's a farmer down there, he'll be your mentor, and he'll sort of teach you how to, you know, pick the apples, how to do all the different things you need. So just go and see him. And his name was Fungus. Um, which because he had a beard it was a bit unusual back then <laughs> and he was a lovely fella real Australian bushman farmer lovely wife and kids and um, so I get to the gate and the farmhouse is like 
you know, 200 metres away. There's no sign saying anything about vicious dogs or anything. So I just, I open the gate, I walk in. So I, I get about 100 metres in. And then this blue heeler cattle dog comes out. And you know what that is? It's yeah. quite a big dog. Australian, I think they have them in the States, but they're big, powerful dogs that are bred for chasing cattle. And I know dogs pretty good. And this dog was savage and he was sprinting. You know how fast dogs can go when they're really, really on, right? This dog was sprinting at me like a bullet. And I could see in his face, he was going to rip me apart. He was just like, you know. And I glanced back at the, the gate, but it was 100 metres back. And I knew by the, the way this dog was coming at me like a shot. There was no way I was going to make it. I was trapped. So I turned to him. And I just thought about my dog that I loved when I was a kid. Dino, his name was. And I, I just sort of imagined that he was Dino. And as I did, it was like the same sort of thing happened. It was like vroom, this love came out of me like, like a laser beam. It was just like vroom, just completely connected me and the dog. And he skidded to a halt like right at my feet he's just skidding there looking up at me like with his eyes wide and like and and my feeling was that he he was seeing god or something you know it was like he went oh it's the one and he 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 leaped up and i'm sort of just standing there he puts his paws on my chest and starts licking me all over the face really just slobber 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 right and i'm just like, like that and then i see the farmers come out he sort of had a run and he's standing there with his hands on his hips and he goes, who the hell are you? He says, that is the most vicious dog around here. And everybody knows that. That is a really, really vicious dog. He told me later this dog, when you chain it up, it was a, a tree with a branch. The dog would leap up like seven, eight foot and grab hold of the branch and just hang there for like five minutes. He's going, you know, let me off, let me off the chain. And he said, you must be a real nice bloke. He says, he says, you know, that dog is just vicious. And that dog became really good mates with me. And, and apparently he'd go with nobody else, but he'd come with me. I'd take the old tractor down to my place. The dog would stay there overnight, sleep under the tractor. His name was Bill. But uh, yeah, so that was not a human, you know, that was a vicious dog and he felt it. And now I realize that was also a sort of a shared death thing. It was like that I was able to open up and that other side came through me. Just that love just went, mm. the dog went, ah, you know, there's paradise. <laughs> wow. And when, and when did that happen in, in time-wise in relation to, to the NDE? Well, that was like two months later. Oh, okay, okay. It was like super, super fresh. I was still sort of sick, you know. I, I, I'd i get really sort of wobbly sometimes. I'd have to sit down and or lie down. I'd just feel like all the energy was drained out of me sometimes and um, my vision was still a bit blurry. I pretty much went blind during my NDE and then the vision came back because my brain was just like busting. Well, David, thank thank you so much for thank you so much for spending time and talking. A, a, a true pleasure. Uh, really appreciate it.